I'd like to begin with uh, two questions that um, someone who wanted to join us uh, but can't um, said he'll look at the, uh, the video. Um, two questions that he had, uh, which actually form a good introduction uh, to all of this. Um, and uh, one was, um, this is the, the uh, Great Dharani Sutra. So in what sense, uh, you know, is it a sutra? Uh, well, sutra just means a thread and kind of in the same sense as a, a computer thread, you know, a line, a line of thought. Uh, but yeah, usually uh, in a sutra, um, Shakyamuni Buddha or some other Buddha is um, presiding and perhaps uh, doing the uh, instruction. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. We simply launch right into uh, the teaching with, uh, and without any indication of uh, who might be uh, delivering uh, this teaching. Um, in connection with that, he uh, asked if uh, the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra had anything to do with another sutra known as the Dharani Sutra. And the answer to that is uh, yes. Here is a copy of the Dharani uh, Sutra. I suppose the, uh, it's uh, Tripitaka Master Xuan Hua, a 20th century Chinese uh, Zen master. Uh, and it indeed contains the great Dharani, the Dharani Sutra does. Uh, but the only other thing that it contains that's uh, in the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra is a list of 10 vows, which uh, we come to rather early uh, in the chant and which I will point out then as being in the Dharani Sutra. Uh, otherwise, um, the Dharani Sutra, which is a conversation between Buddha and Avalokiteshvara, that's the dramatic uh, setting, uh, really consists of Avalokiteshvara uh, just enumerating all of the magical powers that come from uh, chanting the, the great uh, Dharani. And uh, I don't think that's what the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra is focusing on uh, very much at all. You know, magical powers and cures and, and whatnot, although it goes a little uh, in that direction. Uh, the other question uh, he had is, what are we to make of uh, all of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and divinities uh, so far, uh, um, you know, that uh, come up again and again uh, in, in the chant. Um, he wondered, maybe these are just metaphors for states of mind that we have or hope to attain. Do we really have to believe in uh, all of these uh, divinities, all of these bodhisattvas and, and so forth? Uh, and of course, you don't have to believe, but the uh, sutra largely uh, consists of invocations of various bodhisattvas. Um, and in that connection, I want to uh, bring up uh, one of three words, three um, words in the chant that come in over and over and give structure uh, to the chant. And uh, the first is namu. So Namu was usually translated as homage. It's the Chinese version of Namo in uh, Sanskrit, uh, which is uh, a form used in um, when you're talking to more than one person. What we are more familiar with is Namaste. So this is used in yoga all the time. Namaste is you know, hands like this, and you're bowing to the other person, namaste, uh, a form of homage. And uh, that's how um, I translated it uh, in this chant. Whenever Namu, followed by some divinity's name, appears, uh, usually some uh, instantiation of Avalokiteshvara, and I translate that as homage. So we're paying homage to these bodhisattvas, um, but why? Not simply to honor them, but uh, to ask for their help. And another word 
actually a compound word that links in with this is genon, which means literally true words, but is uh, the uh, Sanskrit and Chinese version uh, of mantra. Genon is mantra. So mantra is true words, like really true words. You know. So namu and genon. And the third word is wan, which means vow. So the way I see the sutra structured is that we are taking any number of vows as we recite this sutra. And we are deploying all of these mantras uh, to give us the ability, the power to fulfill these vows. And in the same vein, we are invoking all of these deities, bodhisattvas, asking them to enable us to fulfill these vows. So the vows uh, are at uh, the heart of the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra. The title, of course, refers to Avalokiteshvara, who has a thousand eyes and a thousand hands in order to uh, help this world. So I see some people have joined us uh, a little late, and all of this will be recapitulated anyway as we uh, go through the chant. Um, I will pause uh, after most key sections anyway, or several sections that make some kind of unit, uh, and ask for questions. Uh, and um, you can ask them. Uh, please don't put them in the chat, so I, I won't be uh, checking the chat um, uh, just during a question period, you know, ask your question. Uh, so we'll actually be reading through um, you know, this, which I hope you all have, which is you know, the text of the sutra um, in um, Sino-Sanskrit, let's call it. Originally, it probably was Sanskrit, but the earliest versions we have are Chinese, the Chinese translations of the Sanskrit, and then there seem to have been back translations from the Chinese back into Sanskrit, so it's, it's pretty complicated. Um, so I'm going to read uh, this translation, which is based more or less anyway on you know, the word-for-word uh, -word interlinear translation that I worked out with some scholar friends, I don't know how long ago, but that's in the chanting book. Uh, and with every now and then a glance, just to check at uh, this translation uh, in the back of the chanting book. And that translation is, um, it's quite good in spots, but it really leaves some things out. And I'm pretty sure it was um, dictated by Zen Master Sung San, you know, sitting with one of his students who's writing everything down. And you notice that at the very beginning, right after the title, it simply says, this is the beginning of the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra. Whereas you see, it actually begins, I'm reading from my translation here, today in my concentrated mind appear the countless bodies of Avalokiteshvara's great holy assembly. Each day, innumerable bows. So I think what happened was, Sanchanin was sitting with the student and he points out, this uh, beginning of sutra here, and somebody wrote that down and uh, as if it were a translation of the beginning of the sutra. So uh, that whole uh, paragraph uh, is omitted, um, as uh, is the, the mantra that follows it, uh, the Om Bara Nil. Um, so there are countless bodies of Avalokiteshvara himself and of his great holy assembly. And, that occasions, it necessitates, it obligates us every day innumerable bows to these bodhisattvas. Iriyo Musare. I like that mantra a lot. And uh, you know, yesterday I was doing uh, bows by myself and I didn't feel like counting. So I said, I'm just gonna free form it until, you know, and then it occurred to me to use this mantra for each bow. Iriyo Musare, Iriyo Musare. Each day, countless in both senses of the word, countless uh, bows. Um, you might try that sometime. You know. um, 
So that mantra, and then another uh, mantra, the mantra of uh, purifying uh, the mouth. Um, why we would need to purify uh, our mouth? Well, we're uttering sacred words, so uh, you better brush your teeth first you know, before you uh, start chanting this. And that mantra, Suri Suri Maha Suri Susuri Sabaha. Uh, so uh, mantras um, almost always cannot be translated. They are pure sound. And the sound itself is considered to be efficacious. Uh, but we know that Sabaha means something like hooray. It's uh, an exclamation, you know, rejoicing or something like that. So it makes sense to purify the mouth before beginning chanting you know, this sutra. And then, to make sure everything's okay in heaven with us, we have uh, the mantra of pacifying the gods in the five directions. Um, the five directions are north, south, east, west, and the middle. Uh, so uh, you can actually see uh, paintings with the five gods, and in the middle is uh, always as Vairochana, the great cosmic Buddha who presides over the preaching of the, uh, of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Uh, the others are uh, Amitabha, which is you know, recognizable, and then um, some that I can never remember, but they're Ratna, uh, Sambhava, uh, Akshoba, and Amoga City. Um, so uh, Two out of the five, not bad. Anyway, these are the gods of the five directions, and so we're aligning with the deities of the whole universe, getting in alignment with that uh, universe. And then finally, begin the sutra chant, Ge Gong Ye. Um, and the translation reads, the unsurpassed, profound, sublime Dharma, a lot of superlatives, difficult to encounter in a million kalpas. So we're very lucky. I now hear, see, receive, and hold. So it's not simply um, a matter of mouthing uh, the words. Uh, see, it's interesting. Um, did everybody have to have a chanting book, you know, when this was composed? I don't know. Uh, we do. <laughs> we see it. <laughs> As, um, but the idea is to embody it in, in some sense. And we vow to understand uh, Buddha's uh, true meaning. Um, so this, um, I guess it's only come up <clears throat> once so far, the three namus that are repeated in the mantra of pacifying the gods in the five directions. Um, now here it's... I'm just considering Namu and doing this translation as part of the mantra, so I haven't translated the mantra at all, so I haven't translated Namu. Uh, it will come up uh, later, um, as I explained, this is uh, Namu, like Namaste, homage uh, to the, um, the gods of the five directions. And then the mantra of opening the Dharma treasure. So the sutra is regarded as a repository, a precious repository of the Dharma. So we're calling it the Dharma treasure. And that mantra, O Marana Marada. Um, I don't think we do any of these mantras on any other occasions than uh, in this chant which um, we've always done at the Kansas Zen Center as a regular part of our Wednesday night practice, um, which would, has been for some time the only evening practice uh, that we have. Uh, so it uh, comes before doing the Kwan Se uh, Bosal uh, chanting. So we call all of this together special uh, chanting. By the way, the uh, word yore, wan he, yore, jin chire, yore is the tathagata. It's a Sanskrit for something like thus come. It's the uh, Chinese version of the Sanskrit, uh, thus come. Tathagata, the tatha is like thus, and gata is like go, come, the thus come one. 
So I'll stop here. Any questions on the first page? Thank you, Dan Master, for uh, doing this and for um, for having for having us. Uh, I just had a quick question about uh, Namu. Um, I've heard. I've also heard it uh, translated as "become one with." Yes. So when you perform the gesture, your hands come together, and so you are spiritually uniting yourself with the other person. So it's in that spirit that it means, be, suggests, I would say, more than means, become uh, one with. Uh, but it really is, uh, it simply recalls that, you know, now well known because yoga is so widespread and, you know, namaste, the te is you in namaste, just like in Latin, mm. namaste, homage to you, or become one with you. You know, and, and usually the other person is doing the same thing. So there is a kind of becoming one. So that's the spirit of it. You wouldn't say it's a translation, uh, really. It's a, I, I think I may use it once or twice in here um, to translate Nam. I'm, I'm not sure. But thanks for bringing it up. It's an important point. Um, and I also, you know, you mentioned uh, that we don't use these in any other place. It just, re uh, the beginning of the pacifying the gods in the five directions mantra is at least, I think, similar to, I think part of, I mean, I'm, I'm checking here, uh, but I think it's part of the Kwantzem Bos, it's in the Kwantzem Bosal chanting, if I'm not wrong, right? There's the, um, Namu Samanda Motanam, but then it goes to. It goes to Samanda. Yeah, that the first part is right. That's exactly what you're looking at. Right. And, um, and I think we may find that uh, several times. You're part of a mantra that's familiar to you from somewhere else. Um, it's a really interesting subject in itself. Mantras, you know. Uh, so mantra is sometimes translated as mind covering. The man is, the, everybody agrees, the man is like the Latin mains, uh, man, English mind. Mm. And uh, the tra is some kind of uh, protection or enabling characteristic mantra. So it uh, protect, protect, perhaps activates, perhaps protects uh, the mind. Um, and we may have more to say about that. Well, we're gonna have a lot of mantras anyway coming up. <laughs> so, so then let's go on. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I, could I have a question? Yeah, sure. Um, that Obang Le Wong and Rijishin Jinon, that line, uh, which you've translated as a mantra of, for pacifying the gods in the five directions. Yeah. Which in the chanting book says, instead of pacifies, it uses the word consoles. Yeah, but so, I'm wondering, based on the five Buddhas, yeah. why is it necessary either to pacify or to console these five Buddhas? Well, I saw it as less necessary to console them. I'm sure they're doing just fine. So I didn't <laughs> use that console. <laughs> but maybe they get pissed off every now and then. I said, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> it looks like they're controlling the whole universe. So we want to make sure they're in a good mood. I think that's all there is to it for them. OK. Yeah. I don't know where the console came from, but thanks for bringing it up. I, I rejected it. Okay. <laughs> for, I have a, a question about the, the mantra. You had said that there's no translation. Is it that there's never been a translation? Is that, is that the original yeah. well, use of the mantra? Is as magical words, but that's not always true. Sometimes they certainly can be translated. Mm -hmm. For instance, the mantra that ends the Heart Sutra, Gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhisattva has a definite meaning, and the meaning is important. But in the Heart Sutra, uh, it's not referred to as jinon, it's referred to as ju, ju dukso ju wang. And ju means more spell than mantra. It's a little more magical, <laughs> maybe, uh, than mantra. So that's a little bit iffy there. Is it a mantra or isn't it? <laughs> But it definitely has a meaning. And sometimes you can, you know, words occur in mantras that do have meaning, maybe in another context. So it's not absolutely true. But the idea is, is that the vibrational quality of the sound is what is efficacious. That's the idea. Yeah. 
Any other questions on page one? We have 10 of these. Um, <laughs> then, um, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva with a thousand eyes and hands. Okay, there's the title. And a vast, completely open mind of great compassion. Great Dharani enlightenment requests. Now, this, this is strange. I, I couldn't put it into smoother English, uh, you know, than, than this. Uh, but we're definitely, we're addressing, we're requesting of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva Bodhisattva of great compassion, and that's explicit here. And I think that's important that these thousand eyes and hands are not just for sightseeing and touching things to help, you know, this world. Um, and so we now have this, this long um, supplication. And let me just read it straight through and let's see if it brings up any questions. So I bow to Great Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, mighty and strong, of peaceful appearance, majestic protector with a thousand arms, brightness of a thousand eyes, shining everywhere, proclaiming inwardly true and secret words, compassionate mind arising whole and centered, quickly satisfying all our wishes, wipe out all bad karma from beginningless time, let heaven's dragon love and protect this holy assembly. Perfect, suddenly, a hundred thousand samadhis receive and hold this body bright flag. Receive and hold this body's spiritual treasure, cleansing passions, vow to cross the sea, enter supreme Bodhi's expedient gate. I now declare my devout pledge to understand and fulfill my vows. So the ending is clear. All of this is so we can fulfill our vows. But uh, the rhetoric, uh, well, it rises to high levels, uh, I would say. And um, I don't claim to understand it um, all. Uh, why 100,000 samadhis? Can't you just get one and stay in it? Don't, you know, it would seem to be enough, <laughs> you know, <laughs> have hard enough time doing that. Um, but it's magnificent, and I think that's the main point. I think the rhetoric here is, the level of rhetoric is the main point, uh, and not maybe so much the uh, specific references. Um, the body is referred to as a bright flag. Um, I don't quite know what that means. So I'm, I've been confessing uh, my ignorance here, and if any of you have any ideas, please. What's going on here? No ideas, but uh, where did a thousand arms first start? Do you think it sounds like India, but yeah, how well, long ago? Pastor is definitely from India. You know, I mean, this is a Sanskrit word, and it actually can be construed in slightly different ways. Sometimes it's Avalokiteshvara with an A instead of an E. Avalokiteshvara with an A, uh, the, the A there means a hearing, a hearing this world. The loka is just like the Latin locus, place. Loka is world. So it's the bodhisattva who hears the sounds of the world suffering. But when it's sometimes it's spelled with an E, and then it's not Ashvara, but Ishvara, and Ishvara just means Lord. And then that look is um, construed uh, uh, not as world, but as seeing, hearing. So it's a really complicated name, and, and it depends on how you spell it. Here it's spelled with an uh, E. Um, it comes with the same thing. It's compassion, whether you're seeing or hearing uh, the world and whether you want to be called Lord of, you know, seeing and hearing the world. Um, it's, um, and the, the spelling, uh, scholars think the original spelling was with an A. So the hearing, is there. So when we translate it as quan se um, perceive world sound, 
loka as world and ashvara as sound uh, the, as the chinese translation of avalokiteshvara that's what they were translating instead of avalokiteshvara but i chose this spelling because it's the most common you hardly ever see avalokiteshvara and i thought people might want it as a typo you know whatever should be avalokiteshvara anyway that's about all that um you know, I, I, I can say about this passage, but it ends with a vow to understand <laughs> and fulfill my vows. Um, and then a sequence of vows is going to follow. And it's this sequence of vows that is found in the Dharani Sutra. So the Dharani Sutra contains these vows these 10, exactly the same. And it also contains uh, the great Dharani, as you would uh, expect it to. So those are the only two parts of the text that I can identify as, you know, corresponding with other classical texts. I suspect there are more and I'm just, have, I've been unable uh, to find them. Um, it seems doubtful that all of this was generated just for this. Um, but anyway, that, that's, um, that's all I can uh, come up with. So these vows, and we now actually have Kwan Se Yun, world sound, um, repeated for each of the 10, before each of the 10 vows. And you see that each of the vows begins with the word one, one ah, the ah means I. So I vow, one A means I vow, okay, vow I. Um, and the vows are to attain all dharmas. Um, and we keep paying homage. So it's namu followed by one, namu followed by one. Again, the idea that we invoke these divinities so we can fulfill our vows. And that seems to be a, the underlying structure of the whole sutra or we recite these mantras to enable us to fulfill our vows. So here we're taking 10 vows. Let's just look at the vow part. Attain all dharmas, attain the wisdom I, um, ferry across all beings, that's the first great vow, right? Jung saying, Mu Byon So Wan, Do, that Do doesn't mean save, it means ferry across literally. So this is the first great vow repeated here. Attain expedient means. Uh, that's actually quite important uh, in Buddhism. You want to help, but you don't know how. You've got to find expedient means. And you probably need help to find expedient means. And so uh, you ask for it right here. Um, then we get a little train of imagery starting now. We're going to board the wisdom ship. And the wisdom ship will take us across the sea of suffering. And that's the next vow. Quickly cross the sea of suffering on this wisdom ship. We're going to attain the path of precepts. So I envision it as, as we you know, cross the sea, and now we see this path. This is a little journey. So the path of precepts. And then to climb the mountain of perfect peace. So we're going along this path. Ah and we see this mountain, we're gonna climb that mountain. And we're gonna discover the house uh, of emptiness. So there's this meditation hut on the top of the mountain. I don't know, that's just the imagery that I imagine, and it's not necessary, but it seems to me there's some coherence there. Uh, and find, uh, soon attain the Dharma nature body, the bok song, Shin, the last three words. Uh, bop is um, is dharma, and it uh, it comes up uh, a lot. Um, it comes up in the four great vows where it's mom because the p turns into an m because of the next word beginning with a certain letter. Um, so, any question about that section? So. If I may, I, I was just curious, what would the Dharma nature body be? 
Uh, that would be the body that you have right now as soon as you realize what it is. Okay. <laughs> That's my best guess. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, the Dharma nature body. Um, you know, another way of taking it um, is, you know, not your uh, physical body, but the, um, the, um, the world construed as Dharma nature. So where body is, you know, vast and wide, you know, that line from the morning bell chant, this Buddha's body is vast and wide. I don't know if you know that from the morning bell chants and maybe body, you know, in that sense. Okay, so is this you. Dharma Kaya? Uh, yeah, it's exactly Dharma Kaya. Kaya that, that literally means Dharma uh, body. Um, but um, I don't think that's what is translated in, you know, the Chinese translation of the Sanskrit there. Exactly. You know, this stuff is so complicated. It's, um, it's almost impossible to untangle it all. And I don't want to speak out of place here again, but could from yeah. back, I missed the very beginning. I was having a little trouble connecting, but so yeah. remind me, it said this, these were Sanskrit to um, Chinese is what we have. Is the yeah, Chinese translation the, the of Sanskrit. Sanskrit has been reconstructed on the basis of the Chinese translation of the original Sanskrit. <laughs> okay. okay. That's, um, I don't know, it seems strange that we don't have the Sanskrit somewhere. You know, but, Maybe it'll turn up one day. Yeah, let's, let's go look for it. <laughs> it's somewhere in India, I know it is. <laughs> Maybe it's in Tibet, actually. <laughs> yeah, the Tibetans like this um, Dharani um, very much. I, I haven't talked about the word Dharani yet, so while well, it's in my mind. So Dharani is from the same Sanskrit root as Dharma, so, so the D-H-R. And the D-H-R root in Sanskrit means holding firm, like absolutely real, you can count on it, this is really here. So, Dharma, uh, both in the sense of teaching and in the later philosophical sense of uh, all of the constituents of the universe. You know, the 82 dharmas, um, half of them are mental. I never got much into that. It's very complicated. Uh, but so, a Dharani, like, really holds true. You um, can trust a Dharani, it's for real. Okay, let's go on then to all of these namus. So again, we are becoming one with, paying homage to um, this bodhisattva with all of these names. And I think we're to understand that all of them are uh, Avalokiteshvara. See, so these are all different names of Avalokiteshvara. The perceived world sound great bodhisattva. And you notice when, when you look at uh, you know, the original text on the left, it is Quan se um bosal, perceive world sound, bodhisattva. Uh, and Master, I think you, you skipped a. Um... Did I skip a whole section? Yeah. I, should, but... I skipped the hell realms. Well, that's understandable. <laughs> okay, so this mountain of swords, uh, boiling metal, earth prison, hungry ghosts, warlike demons. Uh, world of animals, you know, there are these uh, six levels of hell, you know, in classical Buddhist theology or whatever you want to uh, call it, uh, none of them very pleasant. Uh, so they're all recounted here, uh, all of the different levels of hell or the different kinds of hell. Um, and if we go there, the swords, the swords will shatter, hellfire will extinguish itself, Earth prison will vanish of itself, poof. The hungry ghost will be satiated. Uh, the demon's anger will be pacified. And uh, the dumb animals, I guess, will attain great wisdom. Uh, so Zen Master Sung San, you know, is famous uh, for saying, uh, you know, when you die, Zen Center, where you go? So I go to hell, start Zen Center. You know? <laughs> so, that's the spirit of, of this section uh, of the chant. Going to hell is no problem. If you go, you're going to save all beings in hell. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm going to hell. 
I don't know in which mode I'm going to help. Could I interrupt? Oh, no, you can ask a question. Um, and mention that this is from the Lotus Sutra. Yes. Yes, this is found in the Lotus Sutra. Thank you. I had forgotten that. Okay. Now let's go on to oh, it's the only more. It's, it's the only place in the chant that's in three fourths time. That's in three quarter time. Ayak yang dosan dosan jate jo. You mean? Yeah. 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 It's got a nice beat. It's very distinctive, actually, in the chant. It really stands out. Okay, so we've been to hell. Uh, and now we're going to have all of these various names of uh, Avalokitesvara, um, beginning with the one we're really familiar with, Kwanse and Bosal, and then Great Power of Wisdom, so the uh, Mahasal, uh, you know, is great, Maha is mega, great. Um, thousand Hands. The uh, wishing wheel, the great wheel, the perceived self nature, the true hasten. You know, it's expeditious. Uh, I love the next two. You have the, the, the full moon, great bodhisattva, and then the water moon. The moon's reflection in the water is, is what that means. So you have the full moon and the moon's reflection in the in the water. Um, and um, that suggests uh, you know, a great bodhisattva. So it's a beautiful image. Um, and then Kundali, great bodhisattva, and eleven-faced great bodhisattva. I think you see paintings with eleven faces. And finally, just more or less out of desperation, just summing it up. Okay, all great bodhisattvas. That's and whether they're identical with Avalokiteshvara uh, or not. And then Amitabha, why not? Um, homage to our root teacher, our Bonsa. Bon means a root, Sa teacher. Amitabha, and Amitabha is the, uh, um, Amita means unmeasurable, Amita. And uh, Amitabha, B-H-A, means uh, light. Um, but then becomes referred to simply as, uh, so Amitabha is infinite of light, but then you talk about Amita Buddha and so Amitabha. So we've invoked um, many great bodhisattvas and we're ready to uh, start the great Dharani. So the great Dharani, of course, is in you know, the uh, Dharani Sutra. Um, and um, Shinmyo, Shin, um, you, you see De Dharani. Uh, De means great, and Dharani, uh, of course, is Dharani. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just using the standard transliteration here, uh, you know, of uh, Sino, uh, our Sino Korean. Uh, original, so you know, no H. Uh, Shin Myo uh, by itself, uh, you know, has meaning. Um, Shin means mine, and Myo means uh, mystic or subtle. And I just know that because my first Dharma name is Gong Myo, you know, uh, empty mystic, something like that, empty mystery. Um, but I'm not so sure about the um, the Gu part, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But anyway, the rest of this. It looks like it's Sanskrit, and there have been many reconstructions of the Sanskrit original and um, translations of those reconstructions, and hardly any of them make any sense at all. Um, but what the Chinese uh, did uh, was uh, translated uh, just by a sound. So they would find a Chinese character you know, that was pronounced, for instance, na. And the understanding is, 
from anybody who's literate enough to read this, oh, we're just using the sound here. If you translate it literally into Chinese, it, it's truly nonsense. Uh, I want to read you a few phrases from uh, the version that reconstructs the Sanskrit. So um, just sometimes it makes sense. Uh, all intentions fulfilled, all paths of existence uh, cleared. Then um, hold on, hold on tightly, stay, I hold on, undefiled, joy rises in me, speak, speak direct, awakened, blue necked one, hail blue necked one, joyous, masterful creator, boar faced. Um, weapon holder. So it could be that we have a whole lot of epithets of Kwan Sam Bosal, of Avalokiteshvara uh, here in Sanskrit. Um, Chinese just translated it for sound, apparently. So the Sanskrit is recreated on the basis of what the Chinese characters sound like. And let's match this up with, let's match up a sequence of these syllables with Sanskrit words. The problem is that uh, there are many, many homonyms in Sanskrit. There are many homonyms in Chinese also, words that sound alike, but have completely different meanings. And so, you know, the whole thing may originally actually have had meaning, but I can't say that that has been successfully reconstructed. Not that I've come across, and I've looked at all kinds of versions, you know, that you can find. We regard it as pure mantra. I mean, that's how we chant it. So Dharani is, can be thought of as a long mantra, and it has the same function uh, as mantra, you know, to, uh, to empower, to enable, uh, maybe even to enlighten, you know. So that's the great Dharani. And uh, I will never do a class on the great Dharani because I, I will never understand it. I've said already everything I know about it. So <laughs> then, um, have I skipped something? Yes. No. I got the root teacher on me table. I think there's a question. I'm sorry? I saw somebody look as if they were about to speak. Does anyone? Oh, have a who was about to speak? Maybe not. Okay, thank you. Then right after the great Dharani, if my pages are in order, we're going to do a sort of a ritual. First cleanse the east, purify the place of enlightenment, because the sun rises in the east, and that's what Buddha saw the morning star rising. Cleanse the south, obtain coolness, that is beyond me. Um, why is it cooler farther south? I don't think you're thinking of the South Pole. In India, you don't obtain coolness by going south. Uh, the West, complete pure land. Aha, that makes sense. Uh, Amitabha finds his Western pure land. Uh, cleanse the North, uh, forever healthy. I don't quite get that. Um, uh, enlightenment place, purified, no flaw. There's a typo no flaw or stain. So what are we purifying uh, here? Um, you know, I remember being an altar boy and the uh, priest going around with the incense and that was supposed to purify the church in some sort of way, at least drown out all of the body odors from the crowd there, I don't know what. Um, but we're purifying our place of practice. Uh, three jewels, heaven's dragon, descend to earth. And I know, keep, and recite this wonderful mantra. And if you look over, you see it is Jin Owen uh, mantra. Um, which mantra are we talking about? The entire chant, vowing compassion and secret protection. So, uh, Compassion is, of course, easy to understand. So is protecting, helping, but it looks like you're protecting yourself, your compassion for others, and somehow invisibly protecting yourself from evil influences. It seems to be what's here. 
um, because it's I who formerly performed various evil actions, so this is a kind of confession, from beginningless time. Greed, hate, and delusion arising from body, speech, and mind, all of which I, that should be now, I'm sorry, it's a typo, I now sincerely repent. So this reminds us of the language of our repentance ritual. Um, and I guess that's still in Dharma Reader. Um, I'm sorry, the, what, what do we call uh, the Dharma? <laughs> Dharma Mirror. Dharma Mirror, thank you. <laughs> Dharma Mirror, the uh, repentance ceremony. And uh, I did one once. So this sounds familiar. Um, I think it's part of our precept ceremony. It's also. also part, yeah, you find it in the precept ceremony uh, as well, language like this. And it's recited daily in some Japanese uh, Zen temples. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay. So sincere repentance. I don't know why I have sincere here. If you look, obviously, the first word there is namu. And... Um, a charm, a charm is a repentance, but I, I think we're invoking uh, the great jewel treasure Buddha, etc., 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 Buddha. That's what the Namu is doing there because we are sincerely uh, repenting and we're asking these Buddhas and uh, many, many names uh, for the Buddhas here to remove karmic obstacles. So we all create these karmic obstacles and they become as big as a mountain. And so we need like an army of Buddhas you know, to wipe out you know, this uh, mountain, to remove these huge karmic obstacles that we've constructed uh, for ourselves. So just reading the names very quickly, Great Jewel Treasure Buddha, Jewel Light Radiant Flame Buddha, All Incense Radiant Fire Power Buddha, 10 Billion Ganges Sand Grains Buddha, Adamantin, destructive earthquake Buddha, universal light moon hall, mystic voice, Lord Buddha, bliss treasure, wish fulfilling jewel Buddha, infinite fragrance Buddha, supreme Lord Buddha, lion moon Buddha, blissful majestic pearl king Buddha, jeweled uh, emperor, wish bestowing, supreme light Buddha. Again, that the, the structure of uh, the chant is to invoke bodhisattvas and buddhas to help us to fulfill our vows here to enable us you know to really repent and then what uh, certainly you know you find in um, repentance and precept ceremonies this language i do not repent the grave offense of killing living beings i do not repent the grave offense of stealing i do not repent misconduct done in lust I do now repent the grave offense of false speech. I do now repent the grave offense of flattering speech. And we're getting into the uh, 10 precepts here beyond the five. I do now repent the grave offense of abusive speech, uh, of hypocritical speech, of craving sex, of anger, and just to sum it all up, of all my foolish behavior. And you, we can all relate to that, I think. I certainly can. And so, uh, again, kind of continuing in the mode of precepts and repentance ceremonies, our karma, uh, same language, accumulated over hundreds of eons is instantly destroyed by one thought, just as fire burns dry grass, destroying completely with nothing left. Sins have no self nature, but arise from thoughts. When thoughts are extinguished, sins are also extinguished. Sins and thoughts both die, both are empty. This is called true repentance. So that's a major section uh, in itself that's uh, familiar from uh, you know, other parts of our, our ritual. Uh, and we conclude it with a repentance mantra. And this should be a uh, familiar. Om Salva Mocha Moji Sadaya Sabaha. So when do we chant that?
during the precept ceremony, during yeah. the birth. And the incense has been lit on our arms and we're waiting for it to die down. Um, everybody chants this uh, together. So many of you, I'm sure, have uh, chanted this uh, during the precept ceremony. So it's nice that we have almost an entire precept ceremony uh, embedded in the Thousand Eyes uh, and Hand Sutra. And again, that is pure, pure mantra. There's no meaning except we know sabaha means rejoice or something like that. And then we begin a section on Junje Bosal. Um, and this section was important to me personally because it became my practice um, when uh, I was undergoing treatment for uh, lymphoma and getting a stem cell transplant. And uh, Junje Bosal is always pictured uh, with uh, 18 arms and hands, you know, da 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 da, and each has each hand has some kind of implement, um, and um, we can just read the beginning of the Junjay Bosal uh, part. Uh, in in um, Sanskrit, it's uh, spelled uh, kundi as if it's kundi, c u n d i. So you might sometimes say kundi bodhisattva. Ah, thank you. Uh, okay, here is the statue of Junjay Bosal that uh, I used and uh, still use. I mean, I use this all during my treatment. It's in the hospital room. Um, and it's, you know, it's good to have a focal point uh, for practice, especially when you're just lying there, you can't move for days. And you just, there it is. and. Uh, it, it really is a wonderful aid uh, to practice something like that. Um, and so this begins a completely new section. And Junjay Bosal is considered to be a version of Avalokiteshvara, uh, an instantiation of Avalokiteshvara, another form of uh, Kwansay and Bosal. I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> Hi everybody, I'm Margaret from Telgo Sen Center. Um, Junjai, Junjai Bosal um, is the mother of all Buddhas. Yeah, Tendu. And the mother of all Buddhas is Gotami, yeah. is Maha Prajapati. Um, and one of her names is Kandi. Yeah, that's Kundi. what I'm talking about. That, that A in Sanskrit is pronounced A. Uh. Uh-huh, yeah, so, yeah. Kundi. Right. So yeah. I have some other things to share later about that, so. Yeah, sure, that'd be great, thank you. Um, so let's get through the, uh, the section. So Junjay Bosal constantly reciting with tranquil mind, yeah, constantly reciting it. Uh, all the various great difficulties cannot invade uh, this person, the person who does that. Heaven and also humans receive merits like Buddhas. Uh, encounter this wish-fulfilling jewel, certain to attain the incomparable. Um, and then we have uh, this mantra. Namu chul guji bulmo de junje bosa. Namu chul guji bulmo de junje bosa. Namu chul guji bulmo de junje bosa. So it's become one with great junje bosa, mother of, here it is, 70 billion Buddhas. Uh, I think you find other numbers sometimes, but 70 billion is a nice round number, I guess. And then uh, the mantra to purify the Dharma realm, Om Nam. The mantra to protect the body, the word Shin there, uh, it means body. And Jin On, of course, is mantra, true words. And then the six syllable great knowledge king mantra of mind's original subtlety. And this is a mantra that's very familiar. Om Mani Padme Hum. And the, um, it uh, seems to mean the, uh, the, the Mani uh, Padme, um, the jewel in the lotus. So Banme here phonetically, but you see it as Padme, P-A-D-M-E, and that's a uh, lotus. And Mani uh, is jewel. And what is the jewel in the lotus or what is the uh, lotus jeweled entity and it's it's interpreted in various uh, ways um, 
And then uh, Junjay's uh, mantra, Nam Saranam Samyak Samuta Guchinam Danyata. Um, again, taking refuge in, now it's seven million and seven, instead of 70 billion. Um, these may be typos of some sort in the original, I'm not sure why it's 70 billion and then 7 million. A perfectly enlightened Buddhist, and it goes uh, like this. Om Jari Jure Junjai Sabaha, Burim Om Jari Jure Junjai Sabaha. And then summing it up, I now receive great Junjai Bosal and make uh, great enlightenment vows. So we're going to have a sequence of vows now. Um, so to um, quickly attain wisdom's brightness, to achieve all merits, to attain victorious circumstances, to attain Buddhahood along with all beings. So the last is pretty clear. The rest, that's a little bit, I don't know. They're fairly vague to me, but the direction is clear. And then there's the word yore again, which is tathagata, the thus come one, i.e. Buddha. Um, and this uh, appears uh, elsewhere, various places, uh, these, uh, these ten great vows. To leave behind forever the three evil uh, destinies, to quickly root out greed, hatred, and delusion, the three poisons. Always listen to Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. We have a th going three themed uh, vows there. To cultivate morality, concentration, and wisdom, another trio. To follow all the Buddha's teachings, to never abandon enlightened mind, to be reborn in favorable circumstances, to quickly see Amitabha, which is interesting because um, if you go to the Western Pure Land, you're not reborn. You just stay there forever. So it's a little inconsistency here. <laughs> um, but maybe it's one or the other. <laughs> um, I vow to perceive bodies numerous as dust motes. I, I really like that, that vision. Bodies numerous as dust motes. It's like you're going to be everywhere throughout the atmosphere, each mote of dust. And finally, to ferry across many beings. And you see the one uh, Guang Do, that Do uh, uh, Jung Sang, to ferry across the many beings. And that's the same Sanskrit as in the, the first great vow. Jung Sang Mu Bion So Wan Do. And then we have the four great vows. And, um, and uh, here I translated Do is save. Uh, I should have stayed with the ferry across. I think I'll revise. It. This is a rough draft, by the way. So well, thank you for your help with it. And clashes, the Bonne, you know, there are many clashes. Uh, we use this, uh, trend. we now have delusions are endless. We've all to cut through them all. Uh, it used to be passions, and both passions and delusions are um, clashes, and there are as many clashes as bad moods as you can think of, uh, you know, that uh, just uh, completely cloud our minds and our spirit. And then uh, dharmas, uh, we say, uh, you know, the teachings are infinite. Well, dharmas is the word, and dharmas are teachings. Without limit, we vow to learn. And the Buddha way uh, is without peer, I vow to attain. And then something that as far as I know, occurs only here, the four great vows again um, with Jia Song. So uh, Jia Song means self nature, that much is clear. But what does it mean? Sentient beings in my self nature, I vow to save. Clashes in my self nature. I'm putting in the in. Um, I don't know what else to do with it. Clashes in my self nature, I vow to cut. Dharmas in my self nature, I vow to learn. The Buddha way in my self nature, I vow to attain. Another way to translate it would be the sentient beings that are my self nature, the clashes that are my self nature, 
the dharmas that are my self nature and so forth. Um, maybe it does occur somewhere else. Has, has anybody ever seen this jasong and this uh, with the four great vows? Uh, um, so I intend to find out by asking some people who should know anyway. Wait, isn't isn't it isn't it from the platform sutra? Yeah. I'm sorry. Six great tracks, sensor. Yeah, the platform sutra. In the self nature, wow. this is the form of the four great vows in the platform sutra. Thus, I have heard. Uh, okay, well, I how to liberate the innumerable sentient beings of my own mind. Own body. Own mind. Own mind. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what it is. Thank you very much. I had just forgotten that. Um, and self nature, own mind, whatever, that's close enough, sure. However, that's going to be translated. So, what does that mean? There's a, a, your body is maybe a little too much. Uh, but maybe it's not. Um, but, like, so, sorry. It, it's all. It's always uh, my understanding of the great vow is that I vow to save all sentient beings. It's and then inside the platform sutra, it speaks of the sentient beings as being the many, many different facets of yourself. Yes. Yeah. All the klesas, the defilements are all you in different yeah, all states. The of and all the Buddha waves, too. Yeah. So somehow we contain, uh, you know, the entire dharmic universe. That is our self nature. We're nothing different than that. That's the direction, clearly. Something like that, anyway. Okay. Why don't we. Uh, ironically, kind of. Uh, yes? I'm sorry. I was going to say, ironically, would that be the principle of no self? Uh, yeah, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, no self except for all beings, all Dharma nature, all. <laughs> mm -hmm. No self well, as we usually think of it. Sorry, while we're on mind and body, could I back up to that Hoshin Jinon? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, in, in your translation, it says it, it uses Hoshin as body, but I thought Shin was mind. Yeah, I think Shim is mind, isn't it? Is, is, is very similar. Because you went sh, uh, oh, shim, S-H-I-M is mine, is it? Yeah, shim with an M. Okay. I might be completely wrong, but I've been using that as a mnemonic device. Shim with an M is mine. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong about that. So, um, it wraps up with something that's familiar to us. Um, wani bar wani, so having made these vows, um, namu, homage or becoming one with the Buddha, which is in, always in the 10 directions, the Dharma abiding eternally, the Sangha abiding eternally in the 10 directions. And we repeat that uh, three times. Um, so we made the vows and usually we have a mantra or a deity or a bodhisattva to support the vows. And now supporting the vows is our complete identity with. Here I really like becoming one as the translation. I don't have it here, but with the, uh, the translation of uh, Namu, I mean, that's the, the spirit of it. That, uh, we are the Buddha, the Dharma, uh, and the Sangha. Uh, and that goes along with the, uh, that version of the, the second version of the four great vows. So we can stop now. Any question about what we've just been through and then any general questions? And Margaret, you said you had something further to share with us. But first, are there any other questions or comments? I'm sorry, what, what are the 10 directions? Yeah, the 10 directions are the eight points of the compass. So north, uh, northeast, east, and so forth, all the way around, and up and down. So that's different from the five directions, which is uh, 
on a plane, I think. It's north, south, east, west, and just that central point. I guess it could be a central axis. I, I think it's the five directions. Uh, middle is one of the directions. So here's the eight points of the compass and up and down. Thank you. So like the, um, the whole universe. It's just one thing about the five directions. Um, in Chinese, the first direction is east, not north. Yeah, it is east. You're right. Yeah, that's correct. We automatically say north, south, east, west. We jump around, don't we? North, south, east, west. I never thought of that. <laughs> so you would say, what would you say? East, west, north, south? <laughs> if you were doing it in Chinese? East, south, west, north. Okay, so you go around, but you start with east. Because yeah, that's the wisest way east, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah, that's where you start. Well, that's uh, that's also how it is in the in the chant here, right? It's first comes the east, second comes the south. Yeah, when we're cleansing but, the five directions, first comes the east, exactly. And yeah. it goes in that exact order. It is, yeah. Makes sense. It's a Chinese chant. <laughs> North, south, east, west. If you do it, you're making the sign of a cross. And I wonder if that's why we say that. That's why we do it? I don't know. I say, why start with north? Because it's at the top, I guess. <laughs> Take it from the top, muse. Yeah. OK, so what else do we have? We managed to get through this in just a little over an hour. Thank you very much. Before Margaret, I just want to make a minor comment that I looked it up in Britannica while you were talking. Yeah, and you, can't, you can be reborn from the pure land. You're reborn as a bodhisattva and you come back to earth to help people. Oh, that's wonderful. Let's get there first. Take a break. Pure land none explained to me that it was optional. It's optional. You can stay there if you want. What kind of guy would that be? <laughs> well, I don't know whether you remember the nun in, in Singapore, Shimhe Sunim. She yeah. has now joined a Pure Land temple. Yeah. So um, I was asking why, and she says, why not? You know, if you are a correct practicing person, any practice is okay. Yeah. So um, then she was saying, you know, what about all these vibes? She says, oh, can come back, you know? Yeah. <laughs> No problem. Zen Master Sun Sun's coming back after he makes that Zen Center in hell. You know, see. <laughs> okay, anything else? Margaret, what do, what do you have for us? Um, well, I, first I want to thank you, um, Zen Master He Kwan, for a really, really wonderful um, teaching and discussion. Um, um, part of my personal practice is to chant the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra every evening. Um, and I've been attempting for a number of years to do that for a thousand days, and I haven't made it yet. So I'm gonna. Can you <laughs> start just, over I, each time you don't. Pardon me. You start over each time you don't make it to a thousand days. Yeah, one time I made it a year and a half, and then <laughs> I was on vacation and I forgot one day, so I started over. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, actually I got this particular practice to practice the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra for a thousand days from my beloved spouse, Christina. That's how she memorized it. Uh -huh. And I often practiced with her when she did that and I'd be on book while she was memorizing it. So but anyway, so that, it, thank you. Um, and I just, ha you know, so I've been practicing with this chant and studying as much as I can about it. Um, and uh, one, one of the things I wanted to share was um, this particular book that just came out. I don't know if anybody else has read it yet. The woman who, I'm going to, it's who called The Woman Who Raised the Buddha. The Woman Who Raised the Buddha, The Extraordinary Life of Mahaprajapati. Hmm. Um, it's by uh, Wendy Garling. Um, and it has all kinds of, and it's, it's very scholarly. And some of it's a little cloying and annoying, but <laughs> that's just Wendy's style, I think. But there was lots of information in it. I've only read it once, so I haven't really studied it yet, but I just want to share a couple of things from it. Um, one is um, uh, the 49 autobiographies in the Terra Apadana section. 
of the Kudaka Nikaya of the Pali Candy uh, Canon. Um, these were left untranslated. These are the these are the nun stories that have been left overlooked and untranslated until recent decades by the scholar Jonathan Walters. So I'm going to be pursuing that. Um, and a lot of his stuff is quoted in here. But I just wanted to share this because I've, I guess, thought for a long time, what is the source of the thousand eyes and hands? And I've often thought it was somehow connected to Mahaprajapati's retinue of 500 women who followed her first in, into, um, into lay practice and eventually into ordination. And here's something I didn't know. Um, when Mahaprajapati decided that she was going to enter nirvana and she chose that because she wanted to die before her son, her foster son, the Buddha, died, um, her entire retinue of 500 nuns did that with her on the same day. And I just find that really fascinating. Um, and I'm going to pursue, be pursuing that more. The other thing that Wendy talks about in this book is that a lot of the, there's a lot of androcentrism in the translation of Buddhism. And sometimes what some of the uh, misogynistic nuns, uh, misogynistic monks, not all of them, I'm not saying all men are that way, but they just redacted the women's stories out of a lot of things, which makes me wonder about the beginning of this being about Avalokiteshvara. I wonder if that's actually true or if he just got inserted because we end with Junje Bosa, the mother of all Buddhas. And I just wanted to share that and thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And I want to pick up on what Margaret just said. Wendy Garling, I guess you could say she's the second or third generation of feminist scholars in Buddhism. She has a book called Stars at Dawn, which is uh, subtitle is Forgotten Stories of Women in the Buddha's Life. Um, there are some um, older compilations of some of the nuns and um, that if we have a if you go to our website and you look under resources and you'll see something that I put up about women and it has a um, it has a reading list at the end and you'll see some of those references to some of the scholarship on the Buddhist women that comes before the the sort of third generation of feminist Buddhist scholars that Margaret is talking about. Thank you. Anything else? Well, while we're talking about uh, um, sort of gender and the gender of the, the bodhisattvas, aren't, um, you know, I, I heard that um, Avalokiteshvara, or at least Kwan Sen Bosal, is sometimes represented as a woman. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly uh, true. And whether we to think of Kwan Sen Bosal as uh, androgynous and uh, simultaneously having uh, both natures, or just kind of assumes one mode and then another, depending on the circumstances <laughs> uh, that uh, help all beings and see what it takes, see see what is most useful in a for a given audience. Uh, you might say, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> That's a pretty good expedient mean. Very good expedient means. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I somewhere yesterday that aren't there like uh, an artistic um, depiction feminine um, qualities then but with a mustache that's been yeah. prevalent in the last, I can't remember, a few hundred years or something like that. That that only appeared in iconography in the last few hundred years. I wanted to say that's the predominant form I thought I read in the few last yeah, few months. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it goes over, a, I think it's about over a thousand years, that iconography. And um, the, um, the origin stories of Avalokiteshvara, there are several. And in one of them, uh, Avalokiteshvara is actually a Chinese princess who made great vows. And when she died, she became Avalokiteshvara. And then there are male origin stories for Avalokiteshvara. And a lot of these bodhisattvas have different origin stories. It's, it's really interesting. I encourage people to Google and look this stuff up because it's really quite fascinating. 
And I, ju I just want to add, yes, and, and all, of, all of that is absolutely true, but in the translation we have, we have the male ending of Avalokita Teshvara's name. The A is the male. So I just, you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, well, so that, I just want, yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so can I ask a related question, which I guess would be, uh, while we're on Bodhisattvas, do a lot of these arise um, throughout like Indian and then Chinese and then other traditions as like individual cults and um, practices and I guess local deities or that kind of thing and that's then they're elevated to and absorbed by the larger canon or how does that work? Through I think you put it well uh, that's the sort of thing that it seems has happened um, over the millennia in uh, the various Asian you know, Buddhist cultures. You certainly see it in Tibet, where they just completely take their own culture and ram everything through it, you know. Um, and maybe other cultures are trying to be more respectful of the received tradition. I, I, I don't know. And I really don't. But yeah, I think you put it well, though. Yeah. Thank you. I think if you go into Chinese temples, where traditionally there's been a syncretism of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. Um, unless you know the iconography, if you go to, into a, a temple that features Tianhe, the Queen of Heaven, you might have some difficulty distinguishing her from Kuan Yin. You know, except that Tianhe is quite often also depicted with children, whereas Kuan Yin is normally not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So when you recall that in the early days of uh, the West discovering China, when they sent statues of Kuan Yin to, to the UK, they thought it was pictures of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> and so there's just this mother figure that I think is very appealing um, in religious things. And it was pointed out to me once when I said, well, the depiction of Kuan Yin in Chinese with the flowing robes and, and, and the cow is female. And a man pointed out to me, how do you explain the bare chest? And you know, I'd never really noticed before, but if you look at Kuan Yin, you'd find that it's very low here. Yeah. You yeah. know, and then there's usually maybe a necklace or something. And when he mentioned it, I looked, took a good look and said, it's got a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, thank you. And if you, if you look at the depiction of the feet, the massive, Kuan Yin in, in the Chinese thing is not a dainty thing. And I once questioned, why are the feet so massive? You know, they said, oh, it's just style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, maybe it is a sort of androgyny, though. And I think maybe we can leave it at that. And, you know, we're pushing our time limit here. But does anybody have any last word? So I want to thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, it's really been wonderful doing this and for everyone uh, who helped and corrected my various mistakes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll meet again in 10,000 years. <laughs>